rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy rib inside which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and but the labors of my hands can fulfill thy laws demands. Could my zeal no respite know, could my tears forever flow, all for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. I draw this fleeting breath when mine eyelids close in death when I soar to worlds unknown see thee on my judgment throne rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment of silent reflection and self-examination. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Jesus Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. 
Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray the prayer of the day. Almighty God, you have filled all the earth with the light of your incarnate word. By your grace, empower us to reflect your light in all that we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 through 14. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will deliver Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the olive oil, the young flocks and herds. They will be like a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. Then young women will dance and be glad, young men old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. Our psalm today is Psalm 147, verses 12 through 20. Extol the Lord Jerusalem. Praise your Lord God, Zion. He strengthens the bars of your gates and blesses your people within you. He grants peace to your borders and satisfies you with the finest wheat. He sends his commands to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He spreads the snow like wool and scatters the frost like ashes. He hurls down his hail like pebbles. Who can withstand his icy blast? He sends his world and melts them, and he hurls up his breezes and the waters flow. He has revealed his word to Jacob and his laws and decrees to Israel. He has done this for no other nation. They do not know his laws. Praise the Lord. Our second lesson is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. 
In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us in the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and under the earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Hello, church. I'd like to begin by welcoming you all. My name is Derek Crawford, and I'm the youth pastor here at Zion. It is my pleasure to be worshiping with you guys all today. Uh, I hope you guys are ready for this. You're about to hear the best sermon of the year. Okay, uh, this is my fourth year doing the first sermon of the year, uh, and I make that joke every time. Uh, so for one week, I get to say that this is the best sermon of the year. I still think it's funny, so I'm going to keep saying it. But anyway, I want to begin uh, with this phrase. We finally made it. 2021 is here, and 2020 is firmly behind us. And this past year has been hard with the pandemic, the riots, the, with the election that we had. It's just felt like that there's been a lot of division. I know it's been a hard year for the church as well. 2020 has been rough. And I imagine that most of you are ready to put it behind you. And I know I'm ready to. I'm ready to fix my eyes on the future, fix my eyes on what lies ahead. And if I'm being honest with you guys, I kind of love where, that, where we're at right now. That we're able to begin this new year filled with such hope. Like, who knows what's going to happen? Who knows what this next year is going to bring? And there's some, there, there's some enjoyment in that. There's some hope in that, in that future that we can rest on. And that's so, I don't know, that's so reassuring to me. And so a new year can bring new and exciting things. And I want that for each and every one of you. I want us to be able to move forward. However, I want to do so in a safe way. I want to do so in a way that follows God's plan and God's design. And so upon reflection over the past 12 months, one thing became very clear to me. And it might sound silly at first, but I could see where rest is needed. And you're probably thinking, wow, rest is all we've done for the past 10 months. Pastor Derek, you're being crazy. And I am, and that lingo is for the youth, uh, so you're welcome, everyone. But yeah, it's true. As I looked back on this year, and I've noticed how we all had to slow down, it just seemed like, I don't know, it just seemed to really stand out that we were in need of rest. And so this past year, many of us had to slow down. Our jobs had to slow down. Now, there were some people where their jobs probably got a lot busier, but I think in general, we all kind of felt that way. The pandemic showed me a world that was incredibly busy. When we were forced to slow down or to stop, it was awkward. It was not normal, and I think that drove some of us bonkers. But really, I think it showed us that maybe we don't know how to rest properly. Or maybe we're not resting in a way that truly does recharge us. And maybe, maybe we're being enslaved to our busy culture, to our busy nature. 
And I don't want this realization of this past year to pass us by. If things start turning or returning to normal, I don't want us to get just lost back in that busyness again. I want us to go into this year restful and in connection with God. So today, in order to accomplish that task, we're going to be looking uh, at the term Sabbath. We're going to be doing a deep dive into that term. What does it mean? Are we supposed to be honoring it today? And so there are many of you who probably have no idea what that word even means. And that's okay. Don't let the word scare you. If I were to question the average Christian, go out on the street and question the average Christian, I would get a wide variety of explanation. There'd be some that wouldn't have a clue what it means, and there's some that could probably give me tremendous detail. And then beyond the definition itself, the practice of the word would also likely be sporadic as well. From my experience, the idea of Sabbath hasn't been taught with any degree of consistency throughout my life. For real, I'm just now starting to kind of understand what the term means. And to be honest with you, I'm still wrestling with it. And so it's one of those things that I'm still growing, I'm still learning. So I I imagine a lot of people are feeling that same way. And that's the tension. That's the tension I'm hoping that you guys are going to wrestle with today in this sermon. So how we were taught growing up might look a little bit different as well. If you took confirmation with me here at Zion... Uh, I'm sure that you know that the term Sabbath is a part of the Ten Commandments. It reads, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. I give give each and every kid, I give them a little white uh, Luther small catechism. uh, And in that, it it talks about the Ten Commandments. And specifically, it has Martin Luther's thoughts on that particular commandment. And so Martin Luther says this, We should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. I want to point out how Luther writes this statement. He wants us to fear and love God, but he does not want us to despise sermons or the Bible or or the message. Instead, he wants us to hold it as sacred, which just means keep it in connection with God. But then he says, do so joyfully so that we can learn more about him, so we can connect more with him. And I really like this explanation. But I think for for many people, I feel like the Sabbath is just uh, one day out of the week that is dedicated to God where you don't do any work. Sure, the day should be held in high respect, and uh, you probably need to listen to a sermon or something at some point during the day. Basically just sounds like going to church, right? Like that's that's all that is required. And I think this is probably the basis for most people's education growing up on this topic. And it's not a bad baseline. It's what I'm hoping the the middle school get by the time they are confirmed. That is the the baseline. However, we can't stay there. We're We're not all middle schoolers anymore. We have to continue to stretch and grow and develop in our faith and our understanding of what God wants for our lives. So... I'm going to try to challenge us. I'm going to try to challenge us to grow a little bit on this subject. So now I'd like to explore the context of the term Sabbath a little bit. As I stated earlier, the term Sabbath is a part of the Ten Commandments, and they are given from God through Moses. And there are two primary accounts of the the Ten Commandments. They can be found in Exodus 20 and also in Deuteronomy 5. And so if if a person were just going to read uh, the the Ten Commandments from Luther's small catechism, or maybe you saw it on a plaque on the wall somewhere, you would miss out on some of the details of what it means, uh, how it describes the Sabbath. Because the Bible expands on the meaning of the Sabbath by describing a typical work week. And so... It says this, where the intent is to rest from work on the seventh day, it states that this is a day that should be honored by you, your son, your daughter, your male and female slaves, your livestock, your alien resident, and your towns. Basically, everyone is included. The idea of Sabbath was meant for everyone. It even included the cows and the livestock, that they're not allowed to do work as well. Then in the Exodus passage specifically, it calls the reader back to the creation story and how God created the world in six days and then rested on the seventh. During this time, humanity was invited in to be at one with God. 
And then sin forced humanity out and this idea was lost. And this makes me ask the question. I don't know. It's just a question that pops up when I think about that story. Why did God need to rest? So I want you to hold on to that question and we're going to jump back to it towards the end of this message. So now we're going to move to the Deuteronomy passage because the Deuteronomy passage is a little bit different than the Exodus because it turns the attention to the time of Moses. Remember that when you, and this, it says this in Deuteronomy 5.15, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So then after God freed the people from, uh, freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, he offered them the Ten Commandments. And at this point is where he invited them back into this time of rest with God. But I still have a question for this one as well. Why was God connecting the Sabbath to slavery in Egypt? That seems strange. It seems odd that this was... Uh, it makes sense that he would point back to the creation story where God rested in Exodus, but it's weird that he's trying to connect uh, the command, the honor the Sabbath with slavery in Egypt. And so I want to hold on to that question as well. Why, why did he do that? These commandments were given to the Israelites and honoring the Sabbath then became a part of their tradition. It became a part of their identity, like who they were. The idea of resting one day a week in honor of their God separated them from all the other nations and cultures around them. It made them unique. It became a significant part of their life. And to dishonor the Sabbath would have been unthinkable. There is an extensive list of things that the Jews were allowed to do and not allowed to do. And some of those tasks included working, cooking, commerce, travel, and many more. When I went to the Holy Land uh, myself, I went to, we were in Israel and we got on an elevator on the Sabbath day and the elevators on the Sabbath are pre-programmed to stop at every single floor because they thought pushing the button would be considered work. So if you were in a 13 story building, you had to ride every single stop. You had to hit every single floor as you went up uh, to your hotel room. I was probably on the top floor, so I probably had to stop at every single one. And, but it's just an interesting. It's an it's a interesting look into how they viewed the Sabbath. And that's today. Like that, that's not like in the time of Jesus. That's happening right now. And so it's interesting how hard that culture held on to this term Sabbath and what it meant to them. So basically, it's, it's the prohibition of war, or the Pro prohibition of work on the Sabbath observed from sundown on Friday until nightfall on Saturday applies not only to Israelites, but also to resident aliens, slaves, and farm animals. Basically, it was a very important to their belief, and it is a defining nature that carried them through all the way to the New Testament, and even some of it through to today. And so the level of importance they placed on the Sabbath became a critical point of tension when Jesus does finally arrive. And so now let's jump forward to the New Testament. Like I said, the Israelites put such an emphasis on the Sabbath and that that behavior continued into the time of Jesus. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus seems to stand at odds with the Jewish leaders on many topics, especially in regards to honoring the Sabbath. And this is strange because Jesus is often seen uh, described or depicted as a person who does honor the Sabbath. He was often found teaching and preaching in synagogues. It says in Mark 1, 21, they went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teachings because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. It seems like Jesus went to church and that he honored the Father in heaven through his teachings. Yet there was still significant conflict between Jesus and the other religious leaders. But why did they take such a strong stand? They seemed to take a great offense to him healing on the Sabbath, picking food from the field for his disciples on the Sabbath, and casting out demons. These instances would have, would have been, or were used to challenge Jesus publicly. So they would take these instances, the, the leaders, and they would challenge Jesus publicly on them. Uh, and they would argue that these violated the Sabbath. 
And as I pointed out earlier, this would have been a big deal to them. And so that's, why they, that's one of the reasons why they pushed back against Jesus so, so hard. And then they would often turn it back to the commandment issued by Moses to confirm their, their point. So basically, they would turn back to the law that was issued under Moses in order to argue their point to, in that day to Jesus. And Jesus didn't dispute that law. Actually, he reinforced it. But he did challenge how they understood it. Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. Jesus was not trying to undo the law of the prophets, undo the law or the prophets, but he was guiding them to a new reality, a new way of living, one that is focused on serving others. In Matthew 9, 12, 9 through 13, so Matthew 12, 9 through 13, it says this, Going from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it has, falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of that and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he reached out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. Jesus pointed out their hypocrisy from their willingness to help an injured sheep, but their unwillingness to help another person, someone who was lost, someone who was hungry, someone who was hurt. Jesus taught that the Sabbath should be for doing good. Serving others was good. What an excellent message. What an excellent way to, to, to look at the Sabbath, to look at what we're supposed to be doing on the Sabbath. Serving others, doing good. Like, I love that. But then Jesus offers another perspective. He says this in Mark 2, verses 27 through 28. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. This verse is a huge deal for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that it showed that the Sabbath was designed specifically for humanity. It's supposed to be something that is good and not something that keeps us bound. So think of it like a parent that says it's for your own good. How many times have you heard that as a kid? Like, I'm doing this for your own good. It's a similar way of, of looking at it. Mainly, Jesus wants the Sabbath to be a place of rest and a place of freedom because we need that. And so remember the question I asked earlier about the creation story. Why did God need rest? The simple answer is he didn't. The Sabbath was modeled for mankind. It was made for us. It was made for our own good. And then when we jump to the other question where we asked uh, about when I talked about liberation from Egypt, why are those two connected? These are connected because the Sabbath is not supposed to be something that holds us down. It's supposed to be something that sets us free. It's supposed to be something that frees us from uh, in slavery to, to sin and brokenness. It's supposed to be something that recharges us from that. It's supposed to be something that liberates us. Just like God freed the Israelites from Pharaoh, the Sabbath is supposed to be a time of rest and liberation. It is meant for good. It is meant for man. And then I want to add one more element to it. I think, you can, I think you can hold track of this because I think it's an important thing to understand. The other aspect of the Mark passage is that Jesus declared himself to be Lord over the Sabbath, furthering this notion that he is God, furthering this notion that he has the authority over the Sabbath. And finally, it gives off the, uh, the intent that everything he does, he does for good. So what does this mean for us today? What are we supposed to pull from this? I want to reflect on that verse that I just gave you one more time, and I want you to think about it. The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I want you to let that sink in for a second. Take a moment, because I think this is the big takeaway that I have from this, uh, from this, whole, this whole message the way it connects back to the creation story. God created the world and then he rested. I think it is evident that God wants that rest for us as well. I think that's the whole point. And man, I really think we need to hear that. 
We live in a very busy world. We live in a very distracting world. And our lives are full. And I think this pandemic has made that abundantly clear. Our lives are so used to the hustle and bustle. And it serves as a good reminder for me. A reminder about how much stuff we've placed in our schedules each and every day. God wants us to honor the Sabbath, to use time to get rest. Humans need the rest, but the type of rest is crucial. And some of us are better at rest than others. I personally have no trouble filling my time. The problem is, is that it's rarely productive. And usually it's not very restful. I can easily watch multiple episodes of TV in a row. It can be easy to fall down the rabbit hole of YouTube. Uh, I think many of us get lost on TikTok for countless hours, where after a couple videos, we look up and we see that several hours have passed. And I get it. And this isn't supposed to be meant as a, as a feeling of judgment on that. We all have our vices. We all have our temptations. And we're all trying to distract ourselves from the busy. I guess I'm here to challenge you instead. Do not let this time go to waste. Find some time to relax with the Lord. And I'm not just meaning sleep. I want, us to, I want you to spend time that tr truly does rest and recharge you. And it's not necessarily going to be found through TV, movies, or games. No, true rest is found in Jesus. And spend some time alone with him. Honor the Sabbath day. Turn off and unplug. Put the phones down. And just spend some time with him. And you know, it does not mean that you can't have fun. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your day. But do so in a way that connects with Jesus. Have fellowship with friends and family. Have a meal with somebody. Spend some time with somebody that needs it. Remember, the Sabbath was meant for good. So when you're, when you're thinking about things to do on the Sabbath, remember that. Remember that concept of doing good. Spend time in prayer. Read his word. Go on a walk with him. And please, this is important. Don't do all the talking. I know I have that problem. I know when I go into prayer, it feels like I'm doing all the talking. I have to remind myself to take a second, take a break. Listen. Listen to what he's trying to tell me. Listen for his guidance. Because I know we're all, we're all going through stuff. We're all going through stuff that we're struggling with. And here's the thing. Lay it at the feet of Jesus. In Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry a heavy burden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. This is not me trying to convince you at all. Jesus wants to lift that burden off of, off of your shoulders, lift the, the burdens of this world off of you. He wants to liberate you from the struggles of sin. He offers us freedom. So why do we resist it? Why do we struggle with rest? When, when we're told that Jesus is doing it for our own good, why do we limit Jesus to just one hour church service on a Sunday? And this is something I have to fight with too. This is something I have to reconcile with as well. Why in the world are we resisting rest and freedom? Why do, why do we feel like our lives are that important that we have to fill them every second? Why can't we just sit back and reflect with Jesus? Why can't we just sit, spend some time with him? And I get it. I'm not trying to uh, diminish what you, everyone has to going on in their lives. I get it. I really do. But I also understand how important this is. I understand how much each and every one of us need this and how God tells us we need it. So take some time to rest with Jesus. Here's the fun thing. He wants to spend that time with you. He wants you to share your life with him, both the good and the hard stuff. What an awesome thought. An awesome thought to just spend time with, with our God. Give it a try. It might actually surprise you. Rest, relax, and recharge with Jesus. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this day that we get to come together and uh, learn a little bit more about you to reflect on, on time spent with you. Lord, I just want you to continue to heal this world, continue to, uh, I don't know, just 
just heal all the, the division and tension that we might be feeling. Lord, we need that now. We need that now more than ever. And so, Lord, as we reflect on this new year, as we move into this new year, Lord, please uh, just reveal to us the ways that we can rest with you, the ways that we can recharge, that we can be freed, that we can be liberated. And so, Lord, we lift all of this up to you, all of our burdens, all of our struggles, we lift it up to you. And Lord, we do this because we love you. Uh, we do this because we submit to you and your authority. And so in the powerful name of Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you all for, worship wor thank you all for worshiping with us today. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I, hope you, I hope you take what I said to heart. I hope you spend some time reflecting on this. Um, have a great week and God bless. Please join me in confessing our faith as we recite the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he look upon you with his favor and give each and every one of you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take my life that I may be consecrated to thee take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful Take my voice and let me sing Always only for my King Take my lips and let them be Filled with messages from Thee Take my silver and my gold Not a mite would I withhold Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose.